This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. And uh, I'm here to introduce Antonello Mastronardi, who is a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Michigan. And is oh, a- Yes, exactly. Your university, you see that? So it's pretty cool. And <laughs> also a member of the 2020 cohort uh, of, of the graduate program in museum studies. And we've had the pleasure of having him at ANS for a three month internship that is finishing up now. So this is uh, the final product, let's say, of his uh, um, internship, even if we hope uh, to see him uh, very often in New York or anyway to be in touch with us. And um, and his uh, research focuses on Roman imperialism in uh, the Eastern provinces in the post Sulan years. So that's why today is going to talk about the very mysterious uh, Atra series, uh, systematic series uh, named Atra series. And uh, I leave the stage to Antonello then. You're muted. Oh. oh yeah, there you go. Oh. Thank you so much, Lucia, and thank you for uh, for coming to everybody. Uh, so first of all, I would like to share my screen and then to start with my few little remarks about what I have done, like what I've experienced so far in the in like you know in these three months here at the ANS, which is I think a good way to begin. Uh, now. During my three months here, I've been looking at hundreds and hundreds of Sistophore, and I have updated the entries for pieces from the Atari period to the to the uh, late, later Republican period, I would say. And uh, now, of course, the highlights of these three months though come from the interaction with the beautiful people that populate these corridors. Uh, I want to thank all of them from the president, Dr. Wartenberg, to the executive director, Dr. Gibrans Boer, to uh, the, chair curate, the chief curator, Dr. Van Alphen, and of course, to my advisor, uh, Dr. Lucia Carbone, who has been incredibly supportive and incredibly um, on point in providing me with help and guidance. And of course, I'd like to thank also the Museum Studies Program, Program of Michigan, which made this internship possible through its uh, you know, professional, emotional, and of course, financial support too. Um, now, I've been mentioning the highlights of these three months as the conversation I've been having with this, with people uh, working in this, in this, in these offices, and you know, like they were seeing me working and working on Sistophore, and some of them have come up to me and started telling me, asking me, how can you? like enjoy doing that they all look like each other they all look they all look the same they all look like each other how can you really enjoy that and yes that's true i mean everybody who's gotten even the smallest experience in sistophoria can probably say that you know there's a lot there's a lot at the first glance that is really like you know like that's repetitive in a sense on the other hand the issue the emission we are Let's let's see why. So, as I say, we cannot say that this emission constitutes a real uh, piece of art. I mean, that's that's I think that's up to taste. Um, anyway, what's important is that for sure it's a pretty unique emission, and not I would say for what it bears on the reverse type, but rather for what it lacks on the reverse type. But I would say a mixture of the two. So first of all, let's look at these two items here that I uh, highlighted through the circle, through the red circle. And the one on top is a monogram. Uh, a monogram that uh, like, you know, has been diversely de deciphered, and we will talk about it later on. On the left instead, you see a cube. And those of you who have had the chance to dig into uh, the uh, volume by Baslau on uh, the coinage of Zillas know 
what this Q stands for, or what is, this Q is like, you know, very likely to stand for, which is the questorial mark. So basically we have, or we should think here, of a questorial emission. Uh, I would also add that the design of the coin, the certain, I mean, to quote William Metcalf, who's here, and I'm really happy that I will have the chance to discuss this issue with, hopefully with him later. Um, like this, a certain looseness in uh, in the design of this uh, of this type. And for instance, you can see that uh, on the left left snake snake uh, is like the head of the left snake is somewhat uh, detached from the body, and that op that actually happens even to a greater extent in other specimens than it does here. Um, in a sense, this looseness, the, uh, also the tendency to use the obverse dies in particular until the very uh, uh, like moment of consumption of the die itself, until basically it wasn't legible anymore on the flan. Well, all those features make us think of a late or later issue. Therefore, something that, you know, like is after, um, let's say, something that is definitely first century, almost for every scholar, possibly in the second half, or at least, like, you know, not in the first part of the first century BC. Um, now, after I, we, looked at the, we looked at the monogram and we looked at the Q, I would say that it's probably time for us to look at another item of the reverse the one on the right and here i changed slide because actually the one uh, the item on the on the right is let's say an alternating item like we have two different uh possibilities we can have a flaming torch the specimen that you see on the left specimen from trade that i found in my in, in my in my in my work over this issue and we can have a, 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 a thyrsus entwined by a serpent by a snake uh, as well so we have an alternation uh, dual possibility here accordingly scholars have you know divided this series into two subtypes let's call them that let's call them that this way for now Sometimes they have tended to see even like, you know, two different um, or like, you know, two, like a greater distance in a sense, almost two different emissions. Um, that's actually a pretty highly debated uh, issue that we will totally focus on. Now you can see, of course, the, dif the difference of these two symbols. The last contribution as I said, I'm really happy that he's attending this talk. The last contribution on this uh, issue uh, is, of course, the one published within the 20, uh, 2017 volume about later systophoric coinage, uh, later Republic systophoric coinage by William Metcalf. Um, Metcalf uh, identified 65 specimens, and those specimens are divided respectively 21. Uh, with the torch uh, right symbol on the reverse, 44 with the thyrsus symbol on the reverse. Uh, now, by looking at the catalog of auction, uh, house, uh, auction houses, by looking at trade in general, and by comparing my finds with the very detailed catalog that Metcalf offers in this volume, I ended up finding other 38 specimens that bring the total to 103 total specimens. So we have an updated sample that is basically um, like, uh, like, you know, the, the, the old sample has been increased by, let's say, more than 50%. And it, this is somewhat significant I would say significant enough for me to show up today and try to make sense of this updated updated sample. Of course, the next step for me has been tried has been trying to and uh, to identify uh, the obverse dyes of the new specimens 
and possibly try to match them with the ones that Metcalf had identified in his dye study. This work has produced uh, seven new obverse dyes, seven obverse dyes that Metcalf had not observed in 2017, uh, which basically bring the total to 40 obverse dyes overall. Now, this one you can see is one of the new obverse dyes are found, actually pretty productive with three specimens, three specimens under under this cap and i called it obverse dyes obverse dye number 36 of course i followed uh i added the dyes on top of the ones already identified by metcalf in 2017. so let's focus on these numbers for a second we have a pretty large issue we have a pretty large issue because my new seven obverse dyes bring the total as i said to 40. and According to the formula um, used by uh, and like you know uh, proposed by Esti in his 2011 study, uh, formula number five in particular, which is the one for those of you who are into quantification that takes into account the number of singletons, uh, this number is roughly around uh, the the number of the ice. Uh, the number of our unobserved dyes should be roughly around 26, 25 to 26, bringing the assumed total of dyes for this emission of the original number of dyes to 66, 65 to 66 original number of dyes. Um, now, this is just a comparanda I'm trying to, uh, a comparandum I'm trying to provide you with for the same for the later issues in which Metcalf locates our emission we have for instance the presence of 21 dyes in a pretty productive mint such as the pergamine mint uh, over the time span of 10 years basically 58 to 49 if you consider the total latest histophoric production of all these means that I indicate here, so Ephesus, Pergamum, Trallis, Laodicea, Apamia, from 58 to 49, so basically all the later histophore I uh, recorded my Metcalf, but the other emission, we have something around 108 dice, around 11 dice per year. Now, of course, bringing the, the old means to get, all the means together doesn't really make sense, but I wanted to provide you with a, you know, like a kind of like idea of how big this issue is. If you think about it, for instance, a famously productive, extremely productive period of Seleucid history, like the one under the rule of Antiochus III, the Great, was attested the production around 10 dyes per year, 10 obverse dyes per year. Uh, a particularly, a strikingly uh, productive issue, such as the patient type tetrodrugs, attest themselves around 15 dyes, 15 obverse dyes per year. Which means that for our issue, if we assume that, you know, like was produced at a high pace, but still within the rule of what it was, uh, like, you know, coinage production at the time. Um, we should think of four or five years for this emission. And I mean, the math is easy enough for me not to do, to do it for you here, which makes it a pretty, you know, like relevant, relevant series for our purpose. Now, I want to remark that in a sense, I'm exploiting the partial informal character of the ANS loan table, uh, because what I'm bringing here today is not exactly a finished product. I'm totally uh, like uh, looking forward to keeping working on this, but it's, of, it's for sure an updated scenario. It's the product of a study. It's not a finished product, but it's a product of a study that has upgraded or updated at least the sample. And therefore, the hope, the hope here is to be able to say something more, both on the issue per se, and possibly to locate it in context. This is gonna be not only a talk about this issue, this is gonna be a talk about an economic crisis which affected the province deeply, let's say around the middle of the century, or peaked around the middle of the century. 
a little bit earlier than that. And this is a talk about how, you know, like the possible uh, inter, how does it work, how, how it works uh, when like, you know, an issue inter, interplays, uh, plays together with a moment of crisis and how the two things can be combined, how the two pieces of uh, knowledge that we have can work together or not. Now, I would like to point out, first of all, that this issue does not bear on its reverse type a lot of information. You can see it, it's graphically pretty evident. The amount of information we're provided with is either obscure or almost obscure, as in the case of the monogram, or scanty in general. Like, if you look on the right, for instance, we have a proconsular issue from Ephesus signed at the very top by Titus Ampius Proconsul. And then we have the signature of the local monier. Uh, this is an issue which, I mean, Ephesus, of course, we have also the date, we have also the era, but in general, see how much information we have on this issue that we lack completely on our reverse type. Let's look at an older specimen. This one is from Tralles. As you can see, the date is uh, either the second half of the 80s or the very beginning of the 70s. And this is an, uh, another ANS piece. And as you can see here, we have a signature on top, above. We have the ethnic on the left. So, and of course, like, you know, we have other control bugs. But in general, the amount of information we are provided with is bigger. That's why I defined our type, a reticent type, because it doesn't want to tell us much about what we should look for. Now, let's start from the monogram. This is a, a, necessary, a necess necessary starting point for us because almost all the dating proposals uh, regarding this issue have started from an interpretation of the monogram. Now, first of all, as you can see, yeah, we can spot two A's pretty clearly. The rest is a little bit more troublesome. But before we approach the monogram, the good question to ask ourselves is, in which alphabet is this monogram spelled? Is it Latin? Is it Greek? And this is not a lazy peregrine question. This is a question that has informed the response of scholars. And therefore, not only the attribution of this issue to a determined magistrate, but the dating itself, the interpretation of the issue itself. Now, first of all, uh, early scholarship, and I'm talking about the early 19th century, tried to tend it to, to like to see a possible mint mark in this monogram. There was a proposal recorded by uh, Pinder uh, of Atarneus as a possible mint for this issue, uh, an Aeolian city. Now, Pinder himself already discredited this proposal pretty, pretty soon. There is no reason why we should think of, Pin of Atarneus, there is no reason why we should think of a mint mark. As we have seen, the monogram is on top of the coin. There is no recorded issue in which the mint mark occupies that position. Usually the mint mark is on the left, as we have seen for Ephesus and Trallis in the previous slide. Can be elsewhere. On top is pretty rare. Actually, it's not, not recorded. So that's enough for 19th century scholarship to uh, exclude that this is a mint mark. So it must be a signature. But of whom? Whose signature? Now, Stumpf in 1991, Gerd R. Stumpf in 1991, had a um, proposal which is very interesting because it's very rich and somewhat, somewhat productive also in the effects that it, in scholarly effects that it had. This is, these are the letters that Stumpf identifies with certainty, the ones on the left, and the ones on the right are the letters that Stumpf declares he thinks he can identify. So if you bear with me, of course, we can identify pretty easily the two A's. We have to squeeze our eyes a little bit more to identify the M that basically follows the same path of the two A's. The T should be pretty evident. You can see the two bars that form it. 
But when it comes to the O, that's the, let's say, most troublesome part in a sense of Stump's proposal, because he sees the O right here. But as you can see, this is not exactly a round circle. This has a flat side on the left. It's rounded on the right. It's, it can be a no, but it wouldn't be the first call that I would come up with. Uh, I will not help you with N, I, and the, uh, the capital U, because, I mean, like, first of all, I think you can spot them by yourself. Secondly, I cannot spot the N. So, like, let's, let's, let's keep on going. Now, once you, uh, Stumpf interpreted this monogram in Latin alphabet and found this letter in it, the next step was pretty was pretty straightforward. And what he, re what he reads here is the name of Antonio. And of course, there are a couple of letters left, an A and an M, which are part of the letters that Stumpf identified with certainty, but they were out of the name Antonio. Antonius, of course. Uh, now, Pinder, who had a similar reading in the 19th century, he thought of uh, um, Lucius Antonius, basically, who uh, served under Minucius Thermus in 5150 uh, BC. Uh, Minucius was a governor of Asia, and Lucius Antonius served under it as a quaestor. Um, and he actually stayed in power as quaestor proprietore until the arrival of the next governor, Fanius. Um, however, you know, like Stumpf says, we have an M and an A. Where is the L? There's no L, we have an M and an A, so how do we make sense of this? Well, that's the way Stumpf makes sense of this. We have a Marcus Antonius name. I have to disappoint, and I'm sorry, it's not going to be the first time those of you are part of the huge fan base of Mark Antony, because this is not our Marcus Antonius. We have to go back in time, a lot back in time, into, into the second century, uh, second century BC, in particular 113 BC, when we have a quaestor, Marcus Antonius, who was uh, was, was served in the province of Asia after a pretty nasty uh, trial dealing with the Vestals that he, he was acquitted in, in Rome. He had the chance to serve in the, in, the, in the province of Asia. But as we've seen, this issue is pretty... Uh, tells, like, it doesn't tell us a lot, but what it tells us is that it's recent or it's later. It's very hard to assume that this issue comes from the second century, from such a higher stage, a high stage of time. Hence, the Metcalf, Metcalf proposal, reading proposal, is, is definitely proved to, be, proved to be much more successful. And this, I would say, makes a lot of sense to the extent that today's talk is entitled Atra Talk and not, I don't know, Amto Talk following Stumpf proposal. Now, Metcalf, of course, followed, like, believed that this monogram is spelled in Greek. And if we believe that this monogram is spelled in Greek, we will easily see the two alphas. We will see a rho here, and we will also see a tau. So, of course, this is the uh, reading, how you read the, uh, this Greek word in the Latin, as if, as if it was spelled in the Latin alphabet. Um, I would say that this reading represents a very a decisive turning point, a decisive turning point, um, both for you know like how we address the as I said I'll address this issue, but more importantly for the attribution. Uh, what Metcalf thought it was the case. Uh, was like basically uh, attributing this issue to Atratinus. Atratinus was the famous praetor of Mark Antony in Asia when he started minting coins after 39. It must have been a quester sometime. We don't, we don't, we don't know when nor where, but uh, that's, that's the assumption. So in this case, we would have an emission located let's say at the end of the proconsular series, 
possibly after 47, if not 42. And uh, the terminus antequem for this emission would be obviously represented by 39, which is the beginning date for the systophoric coinage by Mark Anthony with the, with the Latin legend. Let's say the ending date of the proconsular issue and of the Systophoric College coinage as we know it, something that either as a totally Greek legend or later shows also Latin signatures of Roman magistrates, but retains a vast majority of Greek features. That will not be the case anymore with Mark Anthony. And that's why 39 BC is the terminus antequem for Metcalf to date uh, issue. Now, let's go back to the updated situation that my study has uh, op will hopefully produce uh, in approaching this issue. This is a chart illustrating the relative size of uh, the sample as it was in Metcalf 2017. As you can see here, we have 21 torch specimens, 44 tirso specimens for a total of 65. The proportion is not exactly even, like, I mean, torch are slightly less than half of the tirsus. Uh, the updated specimen, on the other hand, provides us with a slightly uh, more reliable situation. They did that sample, sorry. We have 43 torch specimens, 60 thyrsus specimens. Of course, once my 38 new specimens have been added on top of Metcalf once, for a total of 103. And as you can see graphically from the, uh, from the pie chart, we have a much more even, uh, even if not completely even, sample we can rely, we can rely on. Now, we have talked about, I don't know why this, okay, this is happening. We have talked about the uh, updated sample. The point here is that I want to illustrate how this updated sample uh, better approximates and like, you know, the possibility of, quant of approaching this updated sample from a quantitative point of view is somewhat uh, to be encouraged. That's my first main uh, assumption today. That's my first main take today. Um, and I want to do this by looking at one of the oldest, oldest questions when it comes to this issue. And this question is basically uh, the question about the two uh, symbols that we mentioned briefly touched on before. What do, the, do these two symbols stand for? Do they stand for control mark, a mere control mark of some kind? Do they stand for a mint? Are they a mint mark? The mint mark theory has been pretty successful and uh, for a long time scholarship has tended to believe that actually these two issues uh, these two, sorry, these two symbols tied back to the two different means. Therefore, that our series is to be divided into two subtypes, and each of those two subtypes comes from a different mint. Uh, the flaming torch, for uh, in particular, has been of course linked to Ephesus. In Ephesus, the flaming torch was very recurring as a as a symbol. Uh, we can see here the same coin, the same ANS specimen, the one from 58, 57, the one signed by Titus Ampius, the first proconsular issue in Ephesus, we have the flaming torch on the right. And indeed, it doesn't look exactly like our flaming torch, but we're, we're not die matching here. We're just confronting the symbols. And you know, like this was a pretty suggestive idea for early scholarship. In the same way, a similar, a similar match has been drawn for uh, the Thyrsus that has been um, linked to, uh, to Pergamon, to the Pergamene mint, where the Thyrsus entwined by a, serp, a snake was almost as a successful symbol as the torch in Ephesus. And here we can see a coin from Pergamon. Uh, this is a plate from Carbones, uh, from Lucia Carbones' work 
on late cystophore, and this comes from the uh, latest, I would say the last, uh, the last part, the last generation of the first century, or the second century BC, and you can see here how the two like symbols are in fact the same symbol. But already William Metcalf has uh, meritoriously excluded this option. We are sure today that these two issues came from a single mint. But why? Because Metcalf found not one, not two, but even three dialings between the two uh, sub subtypes. I, of course, see my following is reckoning dialing number one, uh, die obverse die number one, obverse, obverse die number two, obverse die number three. What is new here, though, is that within like you know during my die study or die matching let's call it that way i happen to find other six die links which bring the total to nine so what we knew almost for a fact in 2017 now it's even more substantiated by the updated the updated picture the updated the updated sample that in a sense like you know gives us even more elements on a die basis to exclude the fact that we are dealing here with a two issue, two uh, subsidies issue. Here you can see the three dice in red, three die links in red are linking in dice identified, uh, are sorry, die links identified by Metcalf. The ones in black are linking in dice that had already been identified by Metcalf. The one in light blue, purplish, I don't know, I don't even know which color is that is a new die I found, and uh, the two subtypes link in that die too, in that obverse die too. As you can see, the die links are nine, 22.5% of the total of obverse dies observed, which makes it almost impossible for future scholars to, you know, like to, to, to have a revival of the two means theory. And this is, an example of this uh, of this like you know die link here you can see a, a, a specimen uh, with a torch a specimen with a tirsus and we can see how these two link in obverse die number 18 which has been identified by already by Metcalf in 2017. Now we've seen that dies exclude the um, the hypothesis, the assumption of the two means. But I want to do a sort of like, you know, proof. Uh, I want to prove, uh, to proof, to, to, to double check this, let's put it that way. And in order to double check the, uh, let's say, reliability of my sample, I, I'd like to show how the updated metrological data, the updated weights data of my sample actually better approximate than the than the ones than the previous ones, the situation that we know for a fact was um, like the situation of a single mint. Now you can see that in the data of the 2017 sample um, that amounts to 63 rather than 65 because for two coins uh, I haven't been able to observe the weight. Um, we have a pretty huge gap in the mean value of uh, in the weight mean value between the torch and the tirsus emission. Uh, and you can see how this gap gets significantly reduced uh, during the uh, after after the data uh, the, the data of the updated sample have been examined. You can see that both the mean and the median values come to come closer. It's true that the Thyrsus uh, subtype shows a pretty more irregular behavior in the sense that the quartiles are farther from each other, the interquartile range is bigger, therefore there are more very light and more very heavy specimens. But on the other hand, like data, metrological data tend to bring uh, the uh, two issues together even more in the updated sample and of course tend to meet what we already know from the analysis 
it has the fact that we are we're dealing with a single mint emission and not with a two mint emission. This much for the two mints theory, but let's move on and let's instead try to um, look at metrology not as a unifying factor for our emission, right? A unifying feature that brings together our subtypes, but as something that somehow does the opposite when it comes to locating ATRA in context. Uh, what I'm showing here is a table by um, William Metcalf again, in which we have the mean and media values for all the later systophoric emissions. It does the emissions after 58, 249, uh, except, except for ATRA itself that I removed from the table for a reason. Uh, these are instead the updated data, the updated mean and median weight for ATRA. As you can see, ATRA is definitely heavier than most of this emission. Most of these emissions show lower values. The only one that really presents an interesting uh, like exception to this rule is Trallis at the very beginning of the later systophoric coinage. Um, this one, this, uh, this take, this take, this takeaway will be better illustrated by this other, this bar chart. In this bar chart, I <laughs> did on purpose something that no statistical uh, scholar would ever do, which is basically here you see the bar in red, like illustrating, like, you know, deciding to uh, not to divide uh, further the uh, specimens below 12 grams. But why? Because I wanted to show something. And I wanted to show, first of all, I wanted to show, first of all, uh, okay, yes. I wanted to show, first of all, that I'm sorry, but the message got distracted me, got, got me distracted. I'm going to show, first of all, that we have like a heavy, uh, uh, like, you know, a heavier. Uh, tendency, a heavier behavior here of ATRA when compared to later, later systophoric issues. And this gets more and more true as we move towards a heavier weight. And this is something that we have already seen from mm, the last slide. On the other hand, everything that Anthony means in terms of silver in the province after 39 is incredibly, incredibly lighter than our series of interest. Like to the point that for ATRA, we have not even the 20% of specimens below the 12, uh, below 12 grams. For the, and for Anthony's, Mark Anthony's Cystophori, we have a situation in which more than 90% of them are below 12 grams. Not even to say like, you know, the complete absence of Anthony's, uh, Anthony's Cystophori from the latest, from the heaviest, heaviest, heaviest side of the table. We mentioned Trallis, and we mentioned Trallis as the only exception to the rule of like, you know, a huge distance in weight between the later uh, Cystophore and uh, the Atra series in which that has been located in the later Cystophore by the latest scholarly contribution. Now, Trallis is true, presents a unique situation. Trallis is a unique mean from, many, from very many standpoints. And also when it comes to the weight, especially when it comes to the weight, it shows a remarkable behavior. As you can see, like there is a significant affinity in the fact that the vast majority of specimens from both, I'm sorry, this uh, mouse is incredibly sensitive. Uh, the vast majority of specimens from both issues tend to gather in a high uh, weight range. On the other hand, I invite you to look really close to this uh, left column, uh, left bar on the, on, the, on the extreme left, and to the high value of the Trollan emissions that are under 30%. And why do I do this? Because the Trollan situation, and here I help myself again with Markov's values, is such as all the symbols, all the, sorry, all the specimens, uh, that we've seen on the left of this chart. 
so basically these ones, come from the, la the, the, la the latest moment, the latest actual emission in Tralles of the, Sisto of the uh, later Republican Sistofori. Uh, on the other hand, at the very beginning of this, uh, of this period, we have very heavy ones. In a sense, the only moment in which we can metrologically match our emission, possibly with the Tralan Mint, is this initial moment of the of the of the later systophoric production because after that we have a huge sharp decrease which is already like you know one year to another then we have a break with claudius and then we basically come back with fanius with a much 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 lighter uh much much lighter flans however there is another dividing feature between trallas and there is a dividing feature between trallas and atra which is the unusual, uh, sometimes uh, difficult to understand, diaxis behavior of our emission. Our emission, this is a chart that takes into account uh, all the samples for which I was able to observe, I was able to get uh, diaxis values. As you can see, uh, the ones, uh, the samples, uh, the value, the, the axis value of which is around, is solid 12 hours. So it's a, like, you know, it's a dialine aligned uh, sample uh, amounts to uh, less than the 10% of the total specimens. Uh, of course, I thought it would be better also to check all the specimens bearing a value, between, uh, a value either of 11 hours or one hour, because of course that's so close to 12 hours that you know, like it's the distinction sometimes is mm, not even important, and. Even those amount to a total of 20% of the local, of the total of the total specimens, which is a pretty low number when we think that almost all other cystophoric issues have almost have an almost perfect rate of 100%, 12 hours dies. And then when? The, the good question is: if metrology and dye analysis, and sorry, dye axis tend to push our issue back before. The later, the later systophoric uh, issues. When should we have this? First of all, as I said, the lack of a second signature is already something that should probably warn us that if this is proconsular, this is not strictly proconsular, can be later, but it lacks a feature that is present in all the later issues. Secondly, on the other hand, it's very tough to date this emission to a late to an early stage of time, for instance, uh, as Stumpf did, because you know, like the style is pretty loose, the neck of the uh, the head of the snake is severed from the body, and as you as I told at the very beginning of the of the presentation, we have like a die a behaviors towards dice usage, which is pretty late, like, you know, tending to use dice as much as they could until the very consumption of them before changing it. So we must think of something later, although not possibly as late as after 58 BC. And that's where, like, Michel Amandri uh, comes to our aid through uh, old evidence, and through uh, also like, you know, looking with a very brief remark, also looking at metrology. In 2019, Amandri uh, tentatively located our issue between 67 and 58. So that means not only before, right before our time of interest, our like, you know, uh, later systophoric period uh, in which it, it has been located so far, but also 67 and 58, for those of you who are some, somewhat aware of the history of the province of Asia, are not random dates. 57 and 68, uh, sorry, 67 and 58 as a tongue twister, are the years in which apparently we have a significant stoppage break of systophonic coinage. Now, the terms of this break are pretty, are pretty unclear. Uh, what we know for sure is that in Ephesus, we have a break between those two dates. And we know it because the last Ephesian emission of the uh, 60s is this one on the left. 
is an emission from 66, 67, 66. Why do we know that for sure? Because in Ephesus, we have the date. We have the sign of the era. This is the era 67. Therefore, this must come from this year. The first emission after the break, dated to 58, 57, is the one that we already saw with the signature of Titus Sampius and the new era, uh, 76. So basically, we have a situation in which there are no specimens bearing an era in the, mean, in, in the between, and we have a certainty that in Ephesus there was a break. But was it only an Ephesian story? Scholarship has tended to believe it, to believe so. Pergamum shows some contradictory evidence, like some specimens from some recent words may well come after 67. Laodicea seems to continue minting, although, as Carbone points out, it shows a decrease in the minting operation. But there's another case that is pretty significant, the case of Nisa. Nisa, uh, the specimens dated with eras 23 and 24, uh, are like uh, totally um, have been observed. And since Nisa's dating system was believed to begin uh, with the Sudan settlement, so with 85, 84, like, you know, the latest Nisan emissions in the 60s would date to somewhere around 62, 61. But a recent discovery, namely this coin, this specimen, and the fact that it was included in the 2002 ord that we know was closed uh, at the beginning of the first Mithridatic War, so in 1989, the inclusion of this specimen in that ord uh, makes us push the uh, beginning of the uh, Nizan coinage, uh, of the Nizan, sorry, era, back to 1989. Because otherwise, there's no, like, it's not possible to find, of course, an 85 coin into an, uh, an ord that was closed five years earlier. And therefore, the specimen dated with era 24 must be predated to 67. And therefore, it's very likely that we have a break for Nizan too. This is just to show that the situation of the break is not clear, but uh, the portrait that comes out of it is at least the, the situation of huge economical distress of the province that we know from historical evidence, from historical sources, and uh, uh, of course linked both to the Sudan indemnity and to the next one asked by Pompey. So of course the province was really like, you know, had, like had suffered a couple of moments of clampdown. And it's exactly in that moment that we, that we tentatively introduce our issue of interest. Uh, our issue of interest shows, first of all, as I said, the sign of a questorial intervention that, in a sense, anticipates what we will see later with the later proconsular Sistophore, uh, with the signature right, of, the, of, the, of the Roman magistrate, but not quite. It's not a, that much official, it's not that much formal as it will be from 58 on. But we have the sign of a questorial intervention. And as I said, we, we don't have any other signature but a monogram. We might think that, therefore, what we have here is a, a coin for uh, whose emission uh, was strongly encouraged, if not uh, orchestrated, if not arranged by a quaestor that basically possibly took up local operation, local minting operations uh, for cities that were, if not, not like either not minting at all or heavily distressed and minting much less than they used to. Um, in, a, in talking with talking about it with Professor Carbon after I presented my data to her, she uh, encouraged me to push it like possibly even like, you know, back in the late 60s, when after 66, we have a sharp decrease of coinage, as we've seen, with the beginning of a proper break in some cities. And still the war is ongoing. The um, soldiers who fight against Mitridates have to be paid in Sistophorae, and we don't know which emissions were meant to do that. So our emission, which is pretty big, as I said, can totally, can totally, can totally fit 
in our in our in our in our imagery. So I think that both methodological uh, evidence, as I argued, and as suggested by Garbone, also like you know historical evidence, may uh, tell us to push it even like you know more towards the late sixties than towards the early fifties. Those of you who have good memory and good memory, good uh, a taste for comparanda, will probably remember that the Q is not a unique feature on Roman, actually on Greek coinage, orchestrated, directed, or some, somehow super, supervised by the Roman, by the Romans, because we have a similar case in the uh, questorial issue of the mysterious, otherwise mysterious questor, Isillas. Uh, dated uh, between 93 and 98, on which, as I said, there's a beautiful volume by Robert Baslow. Uh, the Q uh, is a different, uh, is located in a different place, but there's no reason why this Q does not indicate a quester also in our case. Therefore, we have to imagine that the quester really had to intervene. And there is also another piece of evidence or a hint to that, the fact that we don't have a mint mark. Since our monogram cannot be our mint mark, uh, we have the specification of the authority or the person who take charge of the issue, but we don't have a specification of the where of it, which is pretty unique too. And that must mean something. That must mean something in the sense of a detachment from the locality of a mint in the direction of a more, uh, you know, like Romanized author authoritative intervention. This is just a recap. We have, therefore, a pretty large issue for the obverse, observed obverse dice, another tongue twist for a non native speaker, possibly 66 using Estes formula. Let's say four or five years of production. If we imagine that it was a, a, like a coinage. Due to a, an emergency, we can imagine it was squeezed, it was pushed into smaller, into uh, uh, like tighter, a tighter time frame. But still, this is a pretty huge issue. We have had, we have talked about the queue, we have talked about the monogram, and we talked about the, the metrology, which is particularly problematic. And that's my selected bibliography. And with the hope that, you know, like this, the updated specimen, the updated data of this issue will possibly generate or possibly inform new scholarly uh, debate over this issue, over Sistophori, and in general, over the economic crisis of the province of Asia. I thank you all, and I, and I declare, <laughs> and I declare this talk <laughs> over. Thank you all so much for coming here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Antonello. Uh, this was uh, great. Uh, you are also perfectly in the time. And uh, uh, I think you should uh, stop sharing your screen. Perfect. And uh, are there any questions for, for Antonello? Yes. No? No question? Yes. Until Oh, yes, please, Bill. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, well, let's, I have a number of points which are not going to be presented in any very logical order. Um, one is the sample size. <clears throat> the sample has been increased, and I'm not at all surprised at that. Um, I just stopped because there were so many more of these out there and I had connect, collected sufficient material to demonstrate that this was among the largest issues. And to me, the important thing had been to demonstrate the dye linkage. At the time the book went to press, Heritage was in possession of a great many of these coins, um, of which Rick Wachonka had the photographs. Uh, they were reduced size photographs, which would have been very difficult to work with. And um, frankly, I didn't see postponing the publication another year or so to incorporate material that merely added to rather than change the, my own view of 
where we were. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the treatment of the chronology here. Um, the fact that the issue is so large is a fact which argues convincingly to my mind that it must be late. It is never in any horde that we know of, and that includes Halicarnassus, which goes down to 42 BC. And um, for, in my view of things, establishes a, a postquem uh, for the appearance of the so-called Atra issue. Um, as for putting it in the 60s, there, there's a documented gap at Ephesus, but only at Ephesus. Um, the view that it extended to the other mints as well goes back to the time when uh, 133 BC was regarded as the era of Asia. Well, it isn't. Kent Rigsby showed that. It's the era of Ephesus and Ephesus only. And uh, in fact, uh, Dirk Backendorf showed convincingly that cystophoric production at Pergamum is continuous right down through the beginning of the proconsular cystophory. And you show that because hordes that otherwise end with um, Ephesus 67 um, show different termini for the pergamine issues. There are three or four in succession that are added to the Ephesus 67. And therefore they fill this gap that brings us down to the proconsular coinage. Um, the metrology of the Patra issues is different um, because it stands in isolation from all the rest. Um, it may be an attempt to revert to an earlier, higher cystophoric standard, which was abandoned by Antony, who always had financial difficulties, um, to witness the debates state of his denarii. Um, and um, so I don't think that the fact that the standard is different uh, has any particular significance for chronology. Um, I don't insist on being right about everything, but I think I'm right about this. <laughs> But uh, how would you um, answer then to uh, Michel's critique, actually, to your uh, to your chronology, which is you know I haven't seen that. On, on, that on, is news on, for me. Where did you hear? Uh, there is. It's in 2019. 19, uh, 19, uh, it's uh, it's uh, mm, published in the Revue Numismatique, and actually has this. Uh, uh, one of the specimens of Atra was found uh, in a hoard. You remember, and sorry, uh, you should. It's the, no, it's 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 exactly what uh, Professor yeah. Metcalf was specifying. The Alicarnassus hoard. Uh, we're talking about the specimen 605B in your in your catalog. I I, I did my homework. <laughs> no, I remember that part. Well, it can't be 605B. Can it? Yes, it can. <laughs> Asia Minor, 1971. Sorry, no, I said Elicarnassus. I wanted to say that. Yeah, yeah, I, IGCH 1464. Yeah, so Asia Minor, 1971. Um, uh, the let me just look. Um, I happen to have a copy of the book right here. Well, basically, if I can, like, uh, you know, like make a synthesis of, I mean, of course, I try to, uh, to make the best I can of Michel Amandri's argument there is that the inclusion of that, like, I mean, basically, the reason why we would date uh, that hoard late in the 40s, the body of that hoard late in the 40s is the Atra piece. But all the other pieces, like the, la the latest pieces are dated to 54. Uh, we're talking about Claudius pieces, uh, three Sistophore from uh, signed by Claudius, if I'm not wrong. Plus the horde, like, you know, if 
our piece, Atra, were the latest in the hoard, or the most recent should be also the freshest, but it doesn't look like that. It's heavily worn. So by means of this consideration, uh, Michel Amandri pushed the date back. But this was, uh, but this is, as I said, I mean, this, uh, I think Cantonello, this is just uh, food for uh, thoughts. And, uh, and but I'd like to, I'd like to uh, touch on like uh, a couple of points that Professor Metcalf has brought up because I, I'm really, I'm really grateful to him for having done this. Um, it's true, for instance, I mean, let's, uh, let's first of all start from the systophoric break you touched on and then we, we move to the metrology issue. The systophoric break is true, we only, Bagendorf shows pretty clearly that for Pergamum, if we don't have clear evidence that make us, make us conclude that uh, it, the coinage was ongoing on, in Pergamum during the Ephesian break, at least we can assume that, you know, a Pergamum piece is uh keep coming up after 67. that's not the case for nisa though nisa uh with the whole like you know with the inclusion of this specimen i showed in the slides uh in the 2002 hoard which is dated to uh it's, sorry it's been buried during uh at the beginning of the first metridatic war the beginning of the nisan era must begin five years basically uh earlier than that it was thought so yeah, Nisa is a small mean that makes an exception, for instance. So that yeah, doesn't how make is Nisa sense. even relevant? It's not. It's not relevant, but uh, it's 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 not just. I mean, we have a decrease in Laodicea, a decrease of coinage. We can't speak of a stoppage in Laodicea, but we can speak of a period in which the volume of coinage was not as uh, like intense as huge as 10 years before 10 years later but how then do you explain i mean of of this huge issue mm -hmm. and the you've got one coin that may have been you know a part of a hoard that's earlier than 42 bc I, I don't think that's much of a peg to hang anything on. Um, the Asia Minor Horde was not found under controlled circumstances. And if anything is likely to be tossed in to fill out a horde, it would be something from this issue. Um, I wouldn't trust that at all as, as firm evidence for chronology. It's, it's true that the hoard evidence for this issue is particularly problematic in the sense that it's it's very like you know it's not incredibly recurring in hordes and yet yeah, let that's with just trusting one specimen but I mean like here I'm really following Michel Amandri I'm not uh, I'm applying my judgment and I'm picturing a see a scenario in which in order to date it late we have to go against this appearance of this coin the and one against coin. but this one coin and i sorry for this it's just that it's uh, this is this is a fantastic discussion which i think it's really shows how relevant uh, uh, this uh, mysterious uh, issue is and of course, I mean, we are in need uh, of better uh, word evidence uh, for this, uh, and possibly this issue is uh, bound to stay uh, controversial. But I want really to uh, thank uh, Antonello and Bill for this uh, fantastic uh, uh, discussion, which has been absolutely interesting, fascinating, and uh, also very eye opening. Uh, and I'm sorry, I see that there was a question from Walter Holt. Just, I mean, he says, I'm just reading it. It's very, very quick. Since there are so many adverse dice links, but two distinct CD related symbol, uh, would there be a likelihood or even probability that were minted for each CD that rather than specifically in each CD? 
sharing a common mint place? That's very interesting. Thank you so much for this question. Uh, kind of like it's a, I mean, it's half a question, half a suggestion, and I really appreciate this. Uh, I would say that it's an assumption that kind of works well, together well with the queue, the presence of the queue. Like, you know, for the fact that it were me. Well, in a situation in which we have a heavy uh, intervention of uh, on the part of the quiet store. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a thing that you know. As I said, it's a work on pro it's a work in progress. So that's a th an assumption that I would totally evaluate. Anyway, thank you very much to Antonello, uh, to Bill, uh, to everybody, to Walter for this fantastic question, to everybody else for attending this talk. And uh, and we we are looking forward to, to hearing more from Antonello research. Okay, so bye bye everybody. Thank you very much. Eh? Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.